in our last movie, we set up a function, custom function, to handle our errors. And we were able to use our custom function to generate errors, both when our validation rules were violated and when system errors were generated by our script. However, there are limitations to this approach. For instance, we may want to add some error handling for the connection. We may want to add error handling for our MySQL query. And we may, with a much larger and more complex script, want to add error handling to a whole raft of different kinds of functions within our script that may under certain circumstances generate an error. We have no way of foretelling which functions are going to generate errors. If we could, we wouldn't need to worry about any of this. We just iron out all the errors and look into our crystal ball and create perfect PHP scripts every time. This being an unrealistic scenario, we have to think about a way of setting up a consistent error handling system that we don't have to invoke on every line that we want to use it. Luckily, as of PHP version 4, there is a system whereby we can replace PHP's error handling function with our own custom error handler. How we do that is with a simple line of code called set error handler and then we put the name of our function. We should include this at the beginning of our script so that PHP will be using this function, fail in this case, anytime it hits an error. Now the way this works is that anytime PHP finds an error either through faulty syntax or through an error resulting from user data being entered in our script going haywire, it will invoke the fail function rather than its standard error handling, uh, error message generating function. Now, for an error handler, PHP has certain criteria for the kind of function that will be acceptable. It has to take two arguments, the first of which has to be an error number, and the second of which should be the error message that it's going to generate. Now, the reason it needs to know the error number is that there are different classes of errors within PHP. I won't go into a great deal about this, detail about this, but you can have a look in your PHP manual and have a look at the different kinds of errors that PHP uses. As you can see, they're all numbered. They're given binary numbers here, and they also have more user-friendly aliases in words with underscores between them. Now we won't go into great depth about what all the different errors mean. All we need to know for now is that certain of these errors are fatal errors which when thrown up by our scripts will cause the script to terminate. This is an example of a fatal error, e-user error and the other one that is relevant to us is the error. Now, if you look at this list closely, you'll notice that there are other fatal errors such as compile error, fatal compile time errors. There's nothing we can do about these errors in terms of our custom error handling because this will have happened before any of our script is evaluated. So, the ones we're interested in are E underscore error and e underscore user underscore error, both of which will, in PHP's default system, generate a fatal error and stop the program from executing. Let's go back to our script and have a look here. And the way we use the error number here, if we want to simulate the same way of handling errors as the standard PHP error handling. Of course we're going to use our own um, 
error messages here, we're going to use our whoops and the hyperlink at the bottom. But we're going to simulate the differentiation between fatal and non-fatal errors that the standard error handler uses. And we're going to do this by a simple if condition, which is going to test either for e user error or e error, the two kinds of fatal errors that we're concerned with here. And if either of these happen, then it's going to give the hyperlink and terminate executing the script. Let's save that. And usually, when this function is invoked, it will be invoked by PHP itself, and the error number will be fed to the function, as will the error message, depending on the situation that caused the error in the first place. So we can take out this line. And if we go up here, we're going to look at a way to trigger the error without a real error occurring. And when we do this, instead of PHP automatically filling in the blanks for us, because we've triggered the error arbitrarily, we have to, first of all, give the message and also tell PHP what kind of error it is. So let's say it's a user error because that'll make sure that the script terminates and the hyperlink is given. And we're going to do the same with this. Now you may notice that the sequence in which the arguments are given under the trigger underscore error function is the opposite way around from the way that we have to take arguments in this function. This is confusing. I don't know a good reason why this is the case, but as long as we remember that we have to, when using the trigger error function, put the two arguments the other way around from the way around they are in our custom error handler, then we'll be okay. Let's save our script and go over to our browser and see how this is all working out. Let's enter an invalid email address. And we'll submit the form and see what happens. As we can see, our trigger error function has generated an error. And because we specified e underscore user underscore error, it's been a fatal error, so the hyperlink was shown and the script terminated. So far, so good. Let's take a look, if we put in a valid address, or a supposedly valid address, at what will happen when we hit the deliberate error that we introduced right at the beginning of this, of last movie, rather. What will happen when it hits the database connection variable that is empty? Let's have a look. This will not do what we probably hope it will do. In fact, it throws up two different error messages and then it shows the thank you. We have added your comments to the database. So it's not doing what we want it to at all. Now this is very useful for us as programmers because we're getting to see the undefined variable error and we're also getting to see that exactly why that was a problem that the argument was not a valid connection to MySQL. The reason that all three of these appeared was that in our script, we didn't actually specify that any particular error should be thrown out by this line. We just let PHP automatically invoke this function with a different error number than either of the two error numbers we've selected here to cause a fatal error. So we're faced with a choice here. Either we keep on with this system of error handling, which allows for some errors and ignores others, essentially, or allows the script to continue, I should say, 
while simply giving an error message, or we can take out this condition altogether and make every error that is generated a fatal error for the purpose of our custom error handler. Now this is less useful for us as programmers, but it may well be more useful in terms of stopping the users seeing things that we don't want them to see when an error happens. So if we go back to our browser, resubmit the data, as we can see, since every error is treated as a fatal error because we've left out the condition, the invalid connection variable, the deliberate error that we introduced at the beginning of last movie, has done what we wanted it to do. And the beauty of this is that we've done it all without having to introduce any funny little bits at the beginning or end of this line. So if there, is a, if there is an error with this line, or if there is an error with this line, then all of these would generate an error that would include the kind of format that we wanted, in this case the whoops at the beginning, and the click here to go back hyperlink. And it would also stop executing the script so that we never reached this part of the script and ended up with an invalid piece of information being given to the user. That wraps it up for that chapter. And in our next chapter, we're going to be looking at users, authentication, sessions, and cookies. In this chapter, we're going to design and implement a simple login system from scratch. This will enable our users to identify themselves using usernames and log in using passwords that they choose. To begin with, we're going to have a look at sessions in PHP. Sessions allow us to retain information as the user travels from one page within our website to the next. We're going to be looking at registering and unregistering session variables within our sessions. We're also going to have a brief look at PHP's handling of cookies. Then we're going to implement an authentication system that we're going to use for our login and that's going to store a set of usernames and passwords and check the username password pair that the user enters against the database which holds all the valid data. The passwords will be protected by a simple encryption system. Finally, we're going to put all this together and build our login system. Let's take a quick look at the structure that we're going to use for our login system. As a user first enters the site, they're going to come to a page which doesn't need any PHP on it. It's just going to be a simple static HTML page with a couple of links. The first of which will take the user to a login form where if they're an existing user they can enter their details and provided these details are validated they will be able to move on to the main page of our site. We're also going to need a registration form so that new users can register their details on our database. The registration form will allow the user to move straight on to the main page once they've entered their details. From the main page we'll be able to go back to our logout page which will take the user's details out of the system temporarily and allow the user to log in as a different user or register as a new user and users will also be able to move straight from login and registration to log out. That's the basic structure of our login system. Now before we get into the scripts, let's take a quick look at the database 
that's going to be used behind the scenes to store the usernames and passwords. I've set up a simple database called user list and that contains only one table called users and users has three columns the user ID column which is just a primary key that's only going to be relevant for MySQL in fact it's not even called by the PHP scripts and then the username and password will be stored in the other two columns if we look at the data that I've put on the users table we can see that the passwords have been stored using an encryption system this allows a greater level of security if any malicious user were to be able to get access to our users table this would be particularly useful if we're storing any kind of special or confidential information about our users if we're to add a new record into the users table then we use a simple insert statement but instead of when we get to entering the password simply entering a password as data without encryption we can use the MySQL password command which encrypts whatever string we pass it as an argument now when we check back at our data in the table as we can see the password let me in has not been stored as simple string but has been encrypted there is no way to tell from this combination of numbers what the original password was the only way we can check it is to check it against the password which is going to be given again by the user so if we have a look at the users table and check all the records where the password matches let me in we get nothing however if we use our password command again then the record is found using the MySQL encryption command now that we've had a look at our database in our next movie we're going to get right in and start looking at PHP's session facilities as I mentioned in the last movie sessions are a way of allowing us to preserve the value of variables as the user moves between different pages of our website let's take a look at a sample script to show the need for such a facility this script is simply going to set a variable with a value and show a hyperlink to another page which we're just about to write should remember to use single quotes in any embedded quotes that we use in our HTML within an echo or print statement and that's going to be the end of our script there let's save that one as register session var dot php then we're going to write another script that simply tries to recall what we set the variable to on the last script both very simple scripts we'll save this one as show session variable dot php and let's take a look in our browser at our register session var dot php script 
if we follow the hyperlink to the next page, as we can see, the variable has not been declared. So what we can do to make sure that the variable's value is carried from one script to the next is to use a PHP session. The way we do this is to use the session start function at the beginning of the script where we want to register the variable and then we register the variable to our session using session underscore register function then we put the name of our variable in quote marks and we don't use the dollar sign in this particular instance. Now we can simply move to our other script and include the session start function, which we should include at the beginning of any script, where we want the variables that have been registered with our session to be available within the script. Let's go back to our browser and refresh the first page. Then we're going to click to go to the next page. As we can see, the variable has been carried over. Now, the way this works is actually a dual system. There's a system which uses cookies that allows a small file to be temporarily stored on the user's machine. The small file is called the cookie. And then the variables are stored within this cookie and are called by any of our web pages that need to access the variables. Now, some people choose to disable cookies in their web browsers, and this can cause a problem for using cookies in this kind of way. Let's have a look at the internet options on this web browser. This may look different for your web browser that you're using, but there should be a way of disabling cookies so that web pages are not allowed to put cookies onto the user's hard disk. Now that we've disabled these session cookies, if we go back, actually we should restart the browser to make sure that the new settings have been registered. And then we're going to try and call up the same web page, register session var.php. And when we click to go to the next page, as we can see, there's been some data added here. And this is an encrypted form of the data that we asked to be transferred. That is the variable name and the variable value. So by encoding the data onto the end of the URL that it calls, PHP is able to use a backup system if the user has chosen to disable cookies on their browser. This is obviously a very flexible system and one that can work very well for a use such as we are using for sessions in this chapter. You may, however, wish to use PHP's cookie function and we're going to take a look at that in the next movie. In the last movie, we touched briefly on the subject of cookies. Cookies are small files that contain a small amount of information that can be read by our PHP scripts or by any other script that requests them from our user. They're stored on the user's hard disk and so this can cause problems if the user chooses to disable cookies. As we can see from the last movie, PHP sessions allow us to get around to that problem by the dual system. However, we may want to set a cookie manually ourselves. And we can do that in PHP by using the setCookie function. The two words are run together, 
There's no underscore there. And it takes two arguments. The first of which, we name our variable. My color eyes. And then the second argument, we give the variable's value. In this case, green. We're going to then include a short hyperlink to the next page, which we're going to call readfromcookie.php. And after a hyperlink, that's our script written. So let's save this as save cookie.php. And then we're going to write the other script, which is going to pick up the data from our cookie. And all we need the script to do is simply to prove that it's been able to access that data. And we do that by echoing the variable's value to the browser. And that's all we need to do. We don't need to use a specific function to pick up the data from the cookie because PHP automatically checks to see if any cookie is, has any data for it on the user's machine. Let's save our script as read from cookie.php. And we're going to have a look in our web browser to see how that works. First of all, we're going to open the save cookie script. And we're going to go straight on to the next page. And as we can see, the set cookie command saved the data as a cookie to our user's hard disk, in this case our hard disk since it's a local host. And then the next page picked up the data from the cookie and output it to the browser. Of course, if we go to our internet options and choose to disable cookies, then if we refresh our save cookie page and attempt to read from the cookie again, as we can see, PHP has not been able to pick up that data because cookies have been disabled in this browser configuration. So it's worthwhile, although the cookie syntax is a lot quicker and simpler, to consider using the session facility within PHP unless you have a specific reason that you want to manually set your own cookies. In our next movie, we're going to start on the login system that we're going to construct during. As we saw in the first movie of this chapter, we're going to start building our login system by writing an entrance page in static HTML. And then we're going to write the login script, which is going to contain the form where the user can enter their username and password. The entrance HTML page is so simple that it doesn't bear me going through each tag and typing it out. You can find the source for this on the examples folder on this CD-ROM along with the other scripts. The most relevant thing about this page is the fact that it contains a hyperlink which leads to the login page. There's also a hyperlink to the registration page. We're going to do the login page first. So let's start scripting that out. We'll start that with a session start command, which has to come at the beginning of our script before we've served any HTML to the client or the user's browser. We're then going to set up a page with a title and
body section. Which contains the heading login. And then we're going to have some script. Before we write the script, I think we would be better off to quickly write out the form that we're going to use to deliver the variables that the user enters to the script. Now, this form is going to work pretty much the same way as the other forms we've used before, but we're going to use as the target the same name as the script itself. Let's give the script its name, and that is login.php. As we can see, this script calls itself with this HTML form. So when the user enters their data into the input fields, the data will be returned to this very page. We'll see why this is a good idea when we get to writing the script. The first piece of data that the user is expected to enter is their username, and then they're asked for their password. And we're going to use an input type called password so that the stars or asterisks will be shown instead of the letters as the user types them in. And then we need a submit button. And we're going to put the word login on there. That's the end of our form. And that is the final part of our page. Now, this is all the HTML part of this page, but the interesting bit comes in at the middle. First of all, let's put a condition in. What this condition is going to do is it's going to check to see if this page has been called by itself with the relevant data. or if it's being called for the first time from entrance.html or from any other part of the website. So if the if this page is called by itself, then the two variables, user and pass, will have been delivered by the post method to this page. Therefore, these variables should be available to the page. So we can use that as the test condition. Then we're going to test for a variable called logged in user. And we're going to check that that is the same as the username that has just been supplied. Now the logged in user variable is what we're going to register the user variable if we have successfully logged in the user. So in other words, this condition tests whether the user is already logged in, in which case we want to give them an error message. So we're going to use their name to refer to them and say, you are already logged in. And then we're going to put something along, some hyperlinks that will send the user to the main page or to the logout page. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back up to the top of the script and declare a variable here, which is going to contain that data, because we're going to need to use that more than once. So here's our link to the main page. And we can add the next part by using the combine concatenation operator to add the next part of text to what we defined in the first line. 
and that's going to be the logout. link. Once we've defined those two variables, or that, sorry, that one variable, in fact, this is possibly too confusing, so I'm just going to run those two lines together. It makes for a long line of PHP, but that's just a couple of hyperlinks, so we don't really need to, need, need to see it to appreciate what's happening with the script. So down here, instead of echoing the text of the links, we're just going to echo the links variable. Then we're going to exit the script because the rest of this doesn't need to be executed. However, if the user is not logged in under the name that's just been passed to it on the form, so this is a non-logged in user trying to log in, or a user who's already logged in but not under the name that they've just passed through the form, then we want to check the data that the user has given us against the database. So we're going to set up a connection. And it's very inadvisable to simply specify a host with no port or password arguments um, in a real situation. We're going to look at this later on. Just for now, we're going to be still using localhost and keeping it very simple. But I should stress that this is only for our development situation on our local machine and doesn't provide adequate security. But we'll look at that later on. Then we're going to select the database that we created for this login system and we're going to run a query similar to the one that we ran from the MySQL command prompt in the first movie. And what that's going to be is select star from users where name equals, now we're going to have to put a single quote, double quote to break out concatenation operator and the user variable, concatenation operator, double quote to get back in to the string and a single quote to indicate that the value that we're trying to um, compare to the name field has concluded. Then we need another condition, which is that the password column in the users table equals, and here we're going to use the password function, the MySQL password function, to check the data that the user has given us against the encrypted data on the database. Now we're going to see if there is no result, then that's a problem. A result will be given back even if it's a result of nothing. So we have to allow for that kind of contingency. We're going to say, sorry, there has been a technical hitch. We cannot enter your details. And because this is not very likely to happen without a severe problem happening, we're not going to try and let them log in again because this is too severe a problem. So after that if statement, then we can conclude that a result has been returned from this database query. And then we're going to check whether there has really been a match. We're going to check that by using MySQL num rows, and we're going to say if the result is greater than zero, which means that it was able to find a record in the users table where the name was the same as the user variable that the user has just entered in the form given at the end of this script and has been passed back to the script. And the password that they've given has also been correct. If there has been a match, then there'll be one result. There shouldn't be more than one result because we're going to try to keep the usernames unique. However, we should allow for the possibility of another part of our system going wrong, so we're just going to say greater than zero rather than one. 
if this is true, then we're going to set the logged in user variable to the username that was provided by the user. And then we're going to register the logged in user variable using the syntax we discovered in the movie before last. Then we'll give them a little welcome message. And we'll use the name that they have just told us. And then we're going to echo those links that we defined at the beginning of this script. And we're not going to show them the form again, the HTML form, because they've just logged in. So we need to exit our script. If, however, the, there was no result found, as in no rows found in the MySQL result, then we should let them know that their login attempt has been unsuccessful. And after this message, we do want the form to be displayed again. So we're not going to put an exit statement there. Else if, now this else if is referring not to this if statement, but to, as we can see from the indentation, this if statement right up here. So if the user and password were not both entered, then this could mean one of two things. It could mean that the user has come freshly new to the site. However, we shouldn't, as I've mentioned before, expect the users to behave in a logical manner. It could also be because they filled in the username but not the password, or they filled in the password and left the username blank. So we're going to check for that kind of contingency by this condition here which basically says if user is if the user variable has something in it or if the pass variable has something in it we don't need to specify an what's called an XOR which is an exclusive condition that will return true only if user or pass is true but not both because we've allowed for the condition of both in this statement up here. So if the user has only filled in part of the de details, then we need to let them know that they've made a mistake. So we just tell them fill in both fields and leave another couple of line breaks. And then that's our PHP script. Let's save that and we're going to go over to the browser and try out our two scripts. First of all we're going to go to the entrance.html page and we're going to choose the login. Now we're going to try a username and first we're going to try a username that doesn't exist at all and a random password. We're told that the login is invalid, which is good. Then we're going to try putting in a username with no password. We're told that we haven't filled in both fields, which is good. We should try it the other way too. It allows for both contingencies. Now, the final thing we should do is to use the data that we entered in Movie 1 to our database to see if this really works. Let me in was the password and we're going to try logging in and it's accepted Mr. X and logged him in. I recommend with this script as with some others previously that because it's quite complicated you try to create this, duplicate this on your own system and have a tinker around and get familiar with what every part of the script is doing before we proceed to the next movie, where we're going to get the users to. In this movie, we're going to write the scripts for the logout page 
and for the main page that is the user's destination once they've successfully either logged in or registered. First of all, let's write the logout page. For our logout page, we'll need to start the session at the beginning of our script, and then we'll format this page similarly to the other pages within our login site. Include a header that says logout. And then a short script that tests to make sure the user is logged in. And if so, we unregister the variable logged in user using the same syntax as the session register function. Once the variable is unregistered using session unregister, then it's no longer available to our scripts. The session still continues, however, and we can register and unregister individual sessions on their own. If we wish to stop the session altogether, we would use session destroy. That's unnecessary in this case, however. We're just going to give them a message that they're logged out. However, if they somehow get to the logout page without being logged in, then we need to give them a message to that effect. And that's all the scripting that we're going to need on this page. Everything else is going to be simple. HTML, a couple of hyperlinks, but much the same as on the first page, the entrance page to this login system. I'm going to close the body tag and the HTML tag. Then we can save our script. As logout. PHP. And while we're about it, let's write the main page that will give the user something to arrive at once they've successfully logged in. The beginning of each of these scripts we start, we use the session start function embedded within the PHP tag and then we set up this page very similarly to the other one. And then we're going to need another little script for main PHP. And this is a quick check that the user is properly logged in. And we'll do that by checking to see if the variable is not found. And then we're going to give an error message. Now, because we're only giving the hyperlinks to this page once the user is successfully logged in, the only way they'd get to it, theoretically, without logging in is by typing in the URL themselves. In which case, we shouldn't assume that they are authorized to arrive. We should give them this kind of an error over here. We should allow them to 
go back to the login page. where they can log in and enter as a valid user. If, however, they are a valid user, then we need to give them a welcome message using their name, which is stored under logged in user. And then we're going to put uh, full stop in between quote marks there. Looks a bit confusing because of the concatenation symbol that comes just before, but this one's a literal full stop. And then we need a little bit of text to indicate that they've actually arrived at the main page. Our main page, of course, in a real website would be a lot more detailed. But this is simply a main page for the sake of something to try our login system out on. So all our main page is really going to do is allow the user to log out and to view the contents of the main page. Let's save our script, and we're going to save this one as main.php. And now let's pop over to the browser and have a look at how our login system is progressing. If we go back to the entrance page, we can click here to log in, and we can use the username and password that we specified when we entered a record into the database at the beginning of this chapter. Once we're logged in, we can go to the main page. As we can see, our main page has successfully retained this variable here, the logged in user variable, and we're able to log out again. And now that our log, log out has happened, we are able to either log in or register as a new user. And the logged in user variable has been unregistered. That's almost it for our login system. And in our next movie, we're going to look at a script that will allow our users to register as a new user. Our registration script is going to be the longest of all the scripts in our login system. However, not all of it is completely new. We can borrow some of it from our login script. So if we go over there and go down to the end of this script, we can take the form to let the users log in and copy it over to our new page and use it with only slight modifications. If we start, when the form calls the page that it's on, we want to ask for the page name that it's now on rather than the input page that we've just taken it from. We'll also change these prompts here very slightly and we change the name of the button from login to register. But otherwise we can reuse this little part piece of HTML. We're going to save this as register.php. We can also take from the top this part of the script as well and copy that over. Except we're going to say register rather than login and the same for this header here within the body. Now, as we begin our registration script, the first thing we want to check is that 
the user and password have been entered. If the user and password have not been entered, then it's likely that we're entering this page for the first time. If, however, the user and password have already been filled, then what it means is that we have arrived at this page by means of the form at the foot of the page calling the page itself, along with the two variables that were specified down here, user and pass. So we therefore need to make a connection to the database. And we need to select the user list database. And we're going to run a query, which is simply going to select all the users where the name is the same as the value that we've just used as the input from the user. Now, the reason for this query is to check whether the username is already on the database because we want to ensure that all the usernames that we enter are unique so that there's not two users with the same username. So therefore, what we want is to get a negative response or a zero response rather from this query. So if there were, n if there were no rows returned from the query, then we could conclude that the user has not been entered on the database yet. And therefore, we'll allow them to add their name and password to the database. We're going to use this insert SQL statement. And we're going to put the user variable in, and we're going to use the password, MySQL password function, and that will surround the pass variable that they've just handed us. There's a confusing lot of brackets right at the end of here, but essentially the inner bracket is for this password function. The outer bracket is for the end of the demarcation of the values that we're going to enter into the users table. And the last bracket here is the end of the argument for the MySQL query function, which is the SQL string itself. Once we've added the username and password to the database, we want to check that that has been carried out successfully. So if it has, then this will give a true value. If not, we'll get a false value. So presuming that it has been entered successfully, then we can log in the user to save them having to log in straight after registering and we'll register that variable. Then we'll give them a little message to let them know that they've been added successfully. And a couple of line breaks after that. And we want to give them the links to the next parts of the site that they can enter.
along with another couple of line breaks. And we're also going to give them a link to the logout page. Once that's done, then we don't want to execute any of the rest of the script. For instance, we don't want them to get down and see this form again. So we're going to run, use an exit command to stop executing the script. However, if this result here, that is to say the result of the query where we were trying to add the new username and password to the database was false, then we need to let them know that something's gone wrong. So we're simply going to echo this error message. and finish executing the script. In a real life situation, we may want to do something a little more graceful, at least to give the email address where the user is able to contact a technical member of staff to report the error, and even better, to use a system whereby the error would be automatically logged. However, for the sake of our simple login system, we're just going to throw up the error message, and we're going to need another else statement down here. And this else statement, if we look carefully at the indentation, refers to this if statement up here. So if a result was found from this query, and this query, if you remember, is to test whether the username that the user has just entered has already been entered on the database. So if the result is anything other than zero, then we have a problem, and we need to tell them that that username has already been taken. Quick message. And we're not going to put an exit there because we need them to try again using this form. Finally, there's one more else statement that we're going to need, and that's up here. We asked if the user variable and the pass variable had both been filled. However, it's possible that the user, as we saw on the login form, could have simply entered one but not the other. And so we'll use an OR condition down here to test for that eventuality. And then if that happens, we'll want to let them see the form again straight afterwards. So there's our HTML form. And that's our register page. We'll save that, and then we'll test out the whole system in the browser once again. Let's try out registration. And we're going to try a wholly new username. Our username is going to be Kermit and our password will be frog. Our details have been added. We can go to the main page. We can log out. And we can log in using the details that we just added. Our little login system, therefore, works just fine. I recommend that you try out these scripts yourself, either rewriting them to suit your specifications, or just making little alterations 
and examining each part of the script so that you're really familiar with how it works. So that's it for this chapter on sessions and users. And in our next chapter, we're going to cover PHP's object handling. In this chapter, we're going to take a brief look at PHP's handling of objects. Before we do that, there's a couple of things that I should say right up front. First of all, it's perfectly possible to write very effective, efficient PHP script that never touches object-oriented programming, that never defines a class, never instantiates an object, and never sets up any kind of object-oriented structure. Another thing that I should point out is that PHP is not, at its heart, an object-oriented programming language. PHP is built from C rather than C++ and is therefore at its heart a procedural kind of language. This is not necessarily a bad thing as anyone who has tangled with ASP's different collection of objects that it uses would appreciate. However, object-oriented programming can be very powerful and PHP users are increasingly taking advantage of the object-oriented functionality which has been greatly expanded since PHP 4. In this chapter we're going to take a look at classes and objects. Now class is a blueprint for objects to be created within a script. And the objects are the instances of the class. Once we get to our text editor and get scripting, this will make a little more sense. Also through this chapter, we're going to briefly cover uh, these different topics. Attributes, methods of objects, instantiating objects, constructor functions for classes, encapsulation, object inheritance, polymorphism and aggregation. Now, if that sounds like a lot of tongue-twisting words, then let's get away from the theory and go to our text editor and write a little example. We're not going to get into any of the theory or philosophy of object-oriented programming. It wouldn't be very helpful, we don't have time, and it's not going to make you any the wiser about how to make efficient PHP scripts. What we are going to do is to draw up some very simple examples so that you can get in and start making your own classes and objects and working with the object-oriented functionality that PHP does offer. Let's create our first class. We're going to use the keyword class, and straight after that, we're going to name our class. It's usual to name a class with a capital letter. We're going to put a pair of curly brackets to enclose our class definition. Now, class definition can be made up of a lot of different things. But for now, we're just going to declare a simple attribute. And that is the legs attribute. We're just going to define it in the same way as we define a variable. But we're going to use the VAR keyword before it. Now, now we have our class. And what this class is, is no more than a blueprint for the creation of cats. It's not a cat itself. It's simply a bit of knowledge, like genetic knowledge, if you will, 
This is like the DNA, very basic DNA for creating a cat. Now all we know about this cat at the moment is that it has four legs. And this is still a hypothetical cat until we choose to create a new cat. And how we do that is to give the cat a name, uh, same as we name a variable, and then we use this syntax. We use a new keyword to indicate that we want to create an object or instantiate an object in object-oriented speak. And then we use our class name. And then we put the two brackets either side here, just like we're calling a function, which in a way we are. What this does is that we now have an instance of the cat class called tiddles that we can do whatever we want with. Let's have a look at tiddles uh, legs attribute. And when we want to call an attribute of, a, of an object, we need to use this operator, a minus operator followed by a greater than. It forms a little arrow shape. This is similar to the syntax in C++ and may look a little confusing if you're used to the dot syntax of, say, VB or Java. Notice that you don't use the dollar sign before the legs attribute. Let's try this in our browser and we'll see what happens. If we refresh our browser, as we can see, our cat, Tiddles, has had its legs counted and it has four. The reason that PHP knew that our Tiddles object has four legs is that every cat object that we create is going to have four legs, no matter what we call it. We're going to have a look, have a bit more look in detail at properties and methods of objects in our next 